So you you typically hear me on this part of the service talking about what the blessings are to give and talking about what it means to be a cheerful giver and what it means to be a part of what God is doing. And so this morning, I want to kind of give you a little bit of a heads up because things are going to change just a little bit as to how we do that. So what we're planning on doing, and currently we have three ways uh, on, on any given day, actually on any given Sunday, uh, to give. And so we, we take, we receive an offering, the, the ushers bring the, the buckets around, but this is going to be the last week we do that. If you notice, when you walk in or walk out, the table out, out just outside the doors has an offering box on it. Okay, there are some tithing envelopes there. And so what the plan is, is this. We will still talk about God's blessings and we will still refer from time to time to the, to the goodness that comes from being a part of God's plan. And yet we will take the actual offering portion out of our service in the mornings and have that box out there. And you can still go to our website, ChristChurch.pw, and give digitally. You can give online if you like. Uh, and so those are the ways that we do it this morning. And, and so next week, it'll be down to the box out there and online. Those will be the two ways that we do it. And so we are looking to... Um, make moves in a certain direction, and this is part of that plan, part of the vision. And so this is kind of a test to see if that's going to actually work. Uh, and we are looking forward to seeing what the outcome for that is. And so at this point, just join me in praying that God's provision would continue through each of us for his work. Lord, we are so grateful for the fact that you continue to bless us. And you, you call us to, to be a part of the things that you are in the process of doing, whether they be here or far. And Lord, you do some amazing work. And when we grab a hold of you, the adventure just continues to get better. And we are grateful for that. And, and may our gratitude be evident in our hearts and our generosity and the ability that we have to share with others. Lord, we look forward to being a part of making a difference in our community through what you're doing in this church body. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor said it, it ignited and it's it's about God. It's not about a worship leader standing up here telling you, lift your hands, lift your hands, lift your hands. You know, like your worship comes from your heart. Your worship comes from inside, from 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 your your gift that you give back to God. The intimacy that happens through worship is between you and him. And I mean I can coach you all that we want to, but in the end, it's all about you and God. And that's where this authentic worship comes from. And so I ask that you just take that moment and close your eyes and lift your hands and reach out to the God who is everything to us and give him every praise this morning. Amen. Amen.
some sharing and what we really discovered was it's about priorities it's about the love that comes from our God into us through us and when we realize how big how massive how powerful that is and make him our number one priority everything else gets worked out everything else gets worked out don't trust in your job don't trust in your in your spouse don't trust in your car don't trust in your bank account don't trust in that atm machine and definitely don't trust in that scratch ticket we're looking at a god who we can trust through everything at all times he is and always will be the god who keeps his promises Amen. And that promise is in his son, our Savior. Yes. Jesus Amen. 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 And so let's move on to some important work. If you are fifth grade or younger and would like to come and hang out, please feel free to do that. Mary, you are absolutely on point today. Is it close to the bucket? There we go. Nice girl. All right. All right, we're going to grab a chair maybe here in a second. Let's see who, who we get up here. All right, go ahead. Hang on, hang on. There we go, there we go. Ah, hey, good to see you. How we doing? How we doing? Oh, look at that. Oh, we know. We're going we're gonna to go with some chairs. I don't want to. We, that's the last thing I need is for um, uh, somebody to slip. Okay, so let's, let's have this. You can get a chair, though. You want to sit up there? Fine. There you go, girl. Nice. All right, Peyton. Come on, Peyton. Right there. You get you get the, the, the throne. Look at that. All right. So, how's everybody doing? Raise your hand if you're doing good. Raise your hand if you're doing good. Nice. Oh, Xander, you're not doing good? No, Xander's not doing good. All right, Xander, raise both hands if you were at the, at the gear drive last night. Both hands. There we go. Okay, good job. Good job. So... I want to ask you guys something, and I want to, I want to, I want you to think about something for me, okay? The most important thing that you could ever think about is who, Peyton? My mom on the hill. Very good. That is awesome answer. Yeah. You, you definitely got that nailed right there. My mom and my dad, and your mom and your dad are actually a really big blessing, not only to you. Believe it or not, to your brother and your other brother and your other brother, but also to us. And so we are grateful for your entire family. And you know why your family is so awesome is because, here we go, because, okay, because of who? I don't know. You don't know? Let's go with God, okay? Is that good for you? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So Xander, if you think about God, what do you think about? What comes to your mind? I don't know. You don't know? Just, right, what pops in your head do you think God? Jesus. Oh, who said that? Is that you? Jesus. Jesus pops in your head. Not, not as a, does that pop in your head too now? Yeah, I'm okay, maybe. All right, and so when we think about Jesus, we think about some really cool stuff, don't we? Do you know what Jesus did? Yeah. Yeah? What did Jesus do? Mm, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus came as a little baby and lived among us so that he could be with us because he loves us. And then he died, and then he was buried, and then he came back to life. You knew that, didn't you? Yeah. Yes, you did. And, and when that happens, is that just for Jesus or was that for us? Us. That was for us. And and do you know why that was for us? Was it because Jesus loves us or because he just, we all want him? 
He loves us. Very good. I knew you would get that. And so when we think about it then, and we think about who Jesus is, then when we pray and we understand that he is God, now we're actually talking to God, aren't we? And when we talk to God and we understand who God is, isn't it amazing he listens? He listens to each of us. He listens to you because you believe that he is who he says he is. And do you believe, Peyton, that your parents are who they say they are? No. <laughs> Not really sure my parents are who they say they are. But no, they you do. And you believe that your dad is your dad and your mom is your mom. And so when we talk to God, we believe that he is the creator of all things and he is the father of our Savior. Right? Now, so when we talk to him, what is that called? Hey, when you talk to God, what do you call that? Can you do this? Praying. Say it one more time. Praying. Praying. Exactly. And so when we pray, it's a conversation. When you have a conversation with your parents, what happens? Do you just talk or do you also listen? Listen. Okay, wait a minute. Does he listen? <laughs> Uh, sometimes. Okay. Gio, I think that you know about talking and listening. I think you're really good at talking. And I think you can listen, can't you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to look forward to more of that, Mom and Dad. And so what I want us to remember is, though, that when we talk to God, we can listen to Him. Because God is talking to you and you and you and you. And you. He is telling you exactly how much he loves you. Okay? And no matter where you go, no matter what you do, you can always talk to him. No matter what's going on in your life, whether it's a cheer competition, or if you happen to be struggling with a school test, or if somebody at school just got on your last nerve. Does that ever happen to you? Somebody get on your last nerve, Peyton? I'm homeschooled. <laughs> <laughs> happen to be one of the buddiest first people I have, I know in the whole world. So you're a fantastic Good job. And so whether you're homeschooled or not, I want you to remember that you are greatly, greatly loved and you have an opportunity to speak to God and listen because he's speaking back to us and we bless you. And we can find out how he says things and what he says by looking at his word. And that is the Bible. All right, let's pray, guys. Lord, thank you so much for these awesome young people. We ask your continued blessings upon each of them. Please keep them healthy, keep them safe. Keep them close to you, Lord. And may you feel, may they feel your presence, and may your Holy Spirit work both in and through them all the days of their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let me get the bucket out. All right, here we go. There we go. Awesome. All right, so now that all the good fun is over. <laughs> So, an atheist was walking through the woods. What majestic trees, what powerful rivers, what beautiful animals, he said to himself. As he was walking alongside the river, he heard a rustling in the bushes behind him. He turned to look and he saw an eight-foot grizzly bear charging toward him. He ran as fast as he could up the path. He looked over his shoulder and he saw that the bear was closing in on him. He looked over his shoulder again, and the bear was even closer. He tripped, and he fell on the ground, and he rolled over to pick himself up, but the bear was right on top of him, reaching for him with his left paw and raising the right paw to strike. 
At that instant, the atheist cried out, Oh God, save me! Time stopped. The bear froze. The forest was silent. As a bright light shone upon the man from above the trees, a voice came out of the sky. You deny my existence for all these years, teach others I don't exist, and even credit creation to a cosmic accident. You expect me to help you out of this predicament? Am I now to count you as a believer? <laughs> the atheist looked directly into the light, and he said, You're right. It would be hypocritical for me to suddenly ask you to treat me as a Christian now. But perhaps you could make the bear a Christian. <laughs> Very well, said the voice, and the light went out, the sounds of the forest resumed, and the bear dropped his right paw right there and brought both paws together, and he bowed his head, and the bear spoke. Lord, bless this food. <laughs> 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 What would a sermon be without a bad pastor joke? <laughs> Sorry, I can't help myself. So last week, you might remember, we talked about five things. We talked about five things that I recently learned from football. More accurately, five things that I recently learned from football players. In that message, I, I made the comment that there were probably at least five sermons that could come out of that one particular sermon uh, which was actually kind of a mashup or an overview uh, of several topics that were shared by Christian men who just happened to play in the NFL. So then it makes sense that this week we're going to begin a five-week sermon series entitled Overtime, as we get just a bit more out of each of the topics that I shared on Super Sunday. So... I want to tell you that there's going to be one little scheduling change in the midst of that five weeks. At week three, we are going to have a guest, and that will be Tamara Axworthy from ACPC, as we have the Sanctity of Life Sunday on the 5th of March, Lord willing. So if you remember, the first thing that I shared was a story about a guy named Damar Hamlin, and how God used a situation to lead a lot of people to a place of prayer. If you remember, the Buffalo Bills defensive back, Demar was, he was in the process of making a tackle. He, he hit a receiver who had caught the ball, and he suffered in that moment a cardiac arrest. His heart stopped. It was restarted minutes later by the efforts of the training and medical staff of the Buffalo Bills right there on the field. And as the medical staff and first responders were attending to Demar, a prayer meeting broke out right there on the field. The players on the field were praying, fans in the stands were praying, uh, people were praying that were watching on television, people all over the world were praying. And God answered those prayers. Not, not, maybe not right away, but in his time, he did, and continues to do so. Over several days, as DeMar laid in an intensive care unit at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center, more and more people continued to pray, continued to lift him up, continued to intercede for DeMar. And something happened. And it was great. I bet you people who hadn't prayed in years prayed for a football player that they had never met. I bet people who had never prayed before turned to prayer. Especially Buffalo Bills fans, and they, they pray a lot anyway. <laughs> so with all of those people praying, I thought, you know, it might be a good idea for us to dive a little bit deeper into just exactly what does that look like? What does that mean? Why is it that we're concerned with prayer? And how is it that it's had an effect? Well, very simply, prayer is having a conversation with God. It's communication with our Creator. Now, you and I know that good communication involves both talking and listening. And if we're truly communicating with God, that is having a conversation where we're both talking and listening, then we would be able to have a prayer that was most effective. We need to know, though, when we have a conversation with somebody, when you have a meaningful conversation with somebody, one of the things that makes that conversation actually be effective is you know that person. 
you know something about them. And through the conversation, you're probably learning a few things along the way. But when you know somebody, it's a whole lot easier to have a conversation with them. And so we need to know God. We need to have some sort of understanding as to how great our God really is. Many believers pray to a God, unfortunately, who is just too small. Their lack of understanding of God and their failure to give him his power and, and the respect that goes with his power and that all that he deserves reduces God to little more than just a footnote in their lives. And if your God is small, well, then your prayers are going to be small. And if your prayers are small, you know what you're really doing? You're making yourself a big target for the enemy. Small prayers lead to us being a big target for the enemy. Learning how prayer works is part of the natural process of growing in our relationship with the Lord. As we develop an active and continuous connection with God, a give and take, our Father, through Jesus Christ, His Son, and by the power of His indwelling Spirit, then we discover, we discover the heart of prayer by building that relationship. Prayer is a uniquely human activity. Maybe you've never thought about it this way, but quite honestly, um, no other beings have the privilege of communicating with their Maker. And unique. But prayer can be intimidating especially if you're unfamiliar with the practice, or if you've been taught to, to see prayer as some sort of a complex, formal, or ritualized activity. Just, the, just what we do day in and day out, or just what we do every Sunday, we, we repeat the same prayer. Now, that's really not a conversation. If I walked up to you and said the same thing every Sunday morning, and that's all I ever said to you, even if I meant it, there really would be no getting to know each other, would there? And so, we want to take that to the next level. And Jesus had some advice for us. John 16, verse 23, Jesus says, and he was talking to his disciples, and he said, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. And this is not little Johnny's Christmas list that we're talking about. This means that we are to pray in in Jesus' authority on the basis of our union with him and in in the Holy Spirit in us for what would honor and glorify God. Have you ever thought about that, that our prayers to God, what what the prayers actually are, can bring him honor and glory? And you know why that's that is? It's because it then gives evidence of how you see who God is in your life. And then, because Jesus actually is our high priest, we can approach God's throne because of that with grace and confidence. Because of who Christ is and what he has done, the door is open to us to pray to the Father. Hebrews chapter 4 says it this way. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and will find grace to help us when we need it most. You see, prayer that works, the effective prayer must be offered up in faith. James 1 says, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. That's a hard one for us. That our faith would be in God alone. Guys, we rest our faith in so many places. We grab a hold of so much stuff and try to trust in that. And what we're being told here by the author James, who is the brother of Jesus, he's telling us, you got to grab God. Don't grab the stuff in your life. Trust in God. And so he says, do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. 
It's like somebody who is a, a, a Bronco fan this week, but since the Broncos lost, they're going to be a Chiefs fan because they won the Super Bowl. Oh. <laughs> they blow whatever way the wind blows. They go with the wave. They go with the flow instead of grabbing a hold of the one that they can trust. The one that they can trust. Verse 7, such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. And they are unstable in everything they do. Part of praying in faith, Jesus taught, is that we persevere in prayer and never give up. We're going to come back to that in just a second, so hang on to that. You see, prayer is relational. Prayer is relational. It's not meant to be forced, but rather to flow comfortably. And it's to come from our hearts. It's from our hearts to God. And since God knows our hearts, there's no reason to try to do anything otherwise. Right? God knows your heart. Why would you try to pray to him in such a way that is other than what is actually in your heart? Because he knows. Now I'd like to share with you some history written by a fellow named Luke. He documented the life of Jesus in what we would call the Gospel of Luke. And he also documented what the first century church looked like in a book called Acts. So if you turn with me, if you've got a Bible, if you've got an app, however that looks, let's jump into Acts chapter 12, and we're going to be right there in verse 1. And I'm going to set the scene with for you first and tell you about a guy named Agrippa. <coughs> King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, this was John's brother, not, not the brother of our Lord, killed with a sword. And when Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. You ever known a leader who wants to be favored by those who put him into power or those who he rules over? Hmm. Nothing new there, is there? And so when Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he wanted more of that. And so then he took and arrested Peter. And this took place during the Passover celebration, and he imprisoned him. He placed him under the guard, here we go, of four squads of four soldiers each, 16 guys. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. Peter has been arrested. He is stuck. He is going nowhere. And then verse 5, but while Peter was imprisoned, the church prayed very earnestly for him. Hmm. Now, Herod had intentionally arrested Peter, like we had said, when there were a lot of Jews in the city because he thought this was going to elevate his status with them. And so during this time, there would have been a lot of extra folks in Jerusalem because Passover, people were making the pilgrimage, coming up the hill to, to Jerusalem. And so he was likely planning a trial where he was going to come across as the hero where he was going to be the one who everybody looked up to because of what he had done, gotten rid of this troublemaking disciple named Peter. But Peter was being prayed for. The earnest prayer of the believers significantly affected the outcome of events in this story. We don't understand how it is that prayer specifically works. But even so, Jesus consistently commands us to pray. Keep your finger in Acts 12 and then jump into Luke 18 real quick. And Jesus taught the disciples a reason for consistent prayer. And it was a command. Here's what he said. One day, Luke 18, 1, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a certain judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. We've elected these people. Never Don't fear God and don't care about people. Verse 3, a window of that city came to him, a widow of that city came to him repeatedly. She came over and over and over again, saying this, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice just because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord said, Learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end, so don't you think God would surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? 
You see, Jesus taught that persistent prayer is something that all of his followers, not just some, all of his followers should engage in. To persist in prayer and not give up does not mean to subject oneself to endless repetition or painfully long prayer sessions. That's not what we're talking about. It's being consistent, being constant. And being a constant prayer means that we would keep our requests before God as we live for him day by day, all the while believing that there will be an answer. Guys, when we live by faith, we are not going to give up. God might tell us to wait. You've heard that there are three responses to your prayer, yes, no, and wait. And I'm going to tell you, I was talking to Joetta about this last night, yes and no are easy to deal with. That wait one is hard. That's the difficult one. God might tell us to wait, but you know, God's delays are always for a good reason. So as we persist in prayer, we need to grow in character, faith, and hope. Character, faith, and hope. You see, Jesus asks us a question there, though. A question that at first I didn't really understand when I read it, or read it. But he says, how many will I find on earth who have faith? And I got to thinking about that, and I came to realize something. I came to realize that when we pray consistently, when we don't give up, it's because we have faith that God will hear our prayers and he will respond. You see, our constant praying, our constant prayers are a sign of our faith. They are evidence that we are actually the sold out believers that we claim to be. Being a consistent prayer means that your prayer has a really good chance of being heard. Because you have the faith. Let's jump back to Peter now. Acts 12, 6. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, remember he, he's in prison. The night that he was before he was to be placed on trial, he was asleep. He was fastened with two chains between two soldiers. And other soldiers stood guard at the prison gate. Remember how many there were? There were 16. So he's stuck between two, and there is another 14 soldiers that are keeping him in place. Teenagers, are you picturing this? This was not a minimum security setup. Peter was under maximum security lockdown. It's like when your parents send you to your room, and then they lock the door. Right? Maximum security. Peter was under this maximum security lockdown. There is no way humanly possible that he was going to be anywhere but where these soldiers had him or wanted him to be. Or so it seemed. Verse 7, suddenly there was a bright light in the cell and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter and that angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, quick, get up. And then the chains fell off of his wrist. Suddenly, everybody say suddenly. 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 I love that word in scripture. It means we were caught off guard. We didn't see that coming. Didn't surprise God though. There's no suddenly for God. God gets it. It's his plan. It suddenly does. And I love when that happens. God changes the direction that we thought we were going to go. Peter's cell then was flooded with a bright light. And there was no question as to where that light was coming from. In such a dark, dark place, there was no way it was anything but the presence of God. The angel then woke him and commanded him to get up. And I can just see Peter looking up at this angel. Looking up at him with awe as he was getting to his feet. And then without a word, or a bolt cutter, or even a cutting torch, the chains fell off. Can you imagine that, guys? Impact kids, can you imagine the chains just fall off like that? Can you imagine how that would feel to have all of a sudden everything that was holding you in place is released? It's gone. You get broken out of prison by one of God's angels and the restraints that they were using just wash away. I love that image, but you know it gets better. Verse 8, Then the angel told him, Get dressed and put on your sandals, and he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, and the angel ordered him to do so. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time, he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize that what was actually happening. You see, Peter was thinking to himself, This is just too good to be true. <laughs> 
This was just way beyond his understanding. There was no way this could be real. Have you ever experienced something that you thought was too good to be true? I have. She's sitting right here. He thought he was dreaming. Peter thought he was in a dream when this happened. But no, Peter, that's how God works when you have faith. Verse 10, they passed the first and the second guard post and they came to the iron gate leading to the city that just opened to them by itself. Mm -hmm. Didn't need Harry Potter. It just opened. So they passed through and they started walking down the street. And then the angel suddenly left them. I can hear Peter right now singing as he's going down the street. There she was, just a walking down the street. <laughs> he had a spring in his step now. He was moving. He was no longer stuck. And then, you know, I, I think that I think that maybe God was kind of waiting for this point in time for something to kind of fall into place so that God could spring into action. You know, God is a, a patient guy. He was waiting for Peter to be taken into custody and, and, and I believe to be held in the most secure area possible with the greatest precautions, with the most, the heaviest chains and the biggest, baddest soldiers. And God would bust Peter up and then God would get the maximum glory. Breaking out of a maximum security prison means maximum glory for God. Everything about this jailbreak pointed to God. And then suddenly, as the angel showed up, he was gone. Verse 11. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me. Saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. Now, can you, can you picture this? He's, he's walking and he's, he's floating on air. He's, he's so happy and he, he keeps on going. And he, Peter's friends, the church, they were more than likely at this point in time still praying for him. They didn't know. They didn't know he was walking down the street. They were praying with great intensity, and some texts say earnestly, some translations say fervently, and another one even says they were praying strenuously. I love those descriptors. That's what praying looks like when you are absolutely in desperate need. When you desperately need God to show up. That's what the prayer looks like. Guys, they were in some serious prayer time, some overtime prayer, in an effort to save their friend. I would imagine that there were some pretty fervent prayers going up for Damar Hamlin in that football in that football stadium in Ohio the other night as well. And that's because people were desperate. And so here he was now. Peter was at the door. He showed up. Verse 13, he knocked at the door in the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda, 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 she came to open it, and when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside to tell everyone, Peter is standing at the door. <laughs> You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. He's like, hello, I'm still here. I'm here. Yes, it's me. I'm at the door. Can you let me in? Rhoda forgot. Rhoda forgot. And when they opened the door, they were amazed. Their prayers had been answered, as they, just as they had prayed. And when they, when they answered the door, they really didn't believe that that was possible, that this had happened, that their prayers had been answered. And poor Rhoda was so excited and overcome with emotion that their prayers had been answered that she just got all flustered and forgot to open the door. She forgot to let Peter in. It's a good reminder, though, to Peter that even though he had been supernaturally sprung from prison and that he was on his way to freedom, that he was still just a person, just a regular guy like the rest of us. On his own, he couldn't get free from the chains. On his own, he couldn't have opened the jail door. On his own, he couldn't even get into the house unless the servant girl let him in. Peter was no superhero. He was a regular guy. 
And verse 17. He motioned for them to quiet down, and he told them that how the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said, and then he went to another place. At dawn, there was a great commotion among the soldiers about what had happened to Peter. Herod Agrippa ordered a thorough search for Peter, and when he couldn't be found, Herod interrogated the guards and sentenced them to death. Some of the best stories that we can tell, some of the best stories that we can tell someone else are stories about answered prayers, and stories that when we believed, when we had the faith that God would come through, and he did. Those are great stories. I can tell you I love hearing those stories. They are exciting. But even better yet is I love having the opportunity to tell my own story where God showed up, where God answered, where God moved in my life, no matter what those circumstances were. So let me leave you with this. We should all be, we should all, every single one of us, we should all be people of faith who are full-on, prayer warriors. And we need to believe that God answers the prayers of those who seek his will. Okay? That's important. God's will for you is very important. If you put up roadblocks in that will with something that you think you have a better idea, a better way of doing things than what God's got laid out for you, that can get in the way. That can get in the way of having effective prayer. And then we pray We should believe that we will get an answer when we pray. And when the answer comes, don't be like Peter. When the answer comes, we shouldn't be surprised. Rather, express our heartfelt gratitude to the God who loves us, to the God who answers prayer. And let's do that. Let's pray. Lord, you have shown us that our communication with you is best and most effective when we are connected to your will through your Son. It is through Jesus Christ that we have an open door to heaven, that we have an open door to all of eternity. Not because of anything we did, but because of your grace and your mercy for us. Lord, you are beyond our understanding. Help us to have the priorities to put you above all the things in our lives and to trust in you more fully. And to be willing to surrender, to surrender to you everything in our lives, no matter what that looks like. When we give it all over to you, everything, and I mean everything, gets better for us. Thank you for your son. Thank you for all he has done. In Jesus' name we all say, Amen. Amen. So if you are new and have not worshipped with us before, this is something that we do every single week and we take communion. And so we have a bucket in the back with some communion cups. Did I just mess up? I'm good. Okay. I always have to check every once in a while. It's like, okay, did I mess up? No. Okay, we're good. So, oh, okay. And so here's what I want us to do. If you are interested, if you are a full-on follower of Christ, we invite you to join us. And let me tell you this. If you're considering it and you're not really sure, it's okay. Let it go. Just join us in prayer. But when you get to the point where you're ready to surrender your heart and your life to Christ, we will be willing and open and excited to invite you to join us. So, as we take of the bread this morning, we need to be reminded of who Jesus is. And here's what I want to share with you. In Mark chapter 1, verse 40, there's a story that is very short, and it's a story that gives us hope and encouragement. And it's a story about a guy with leprosy. A man with leprosy came and he knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, to be healed. And instantly, the leprosy disappeared. And the man was healed. It is through what Christ did on the cross that we are also healed. Jesus gives us the opportunity to come before him and to say the same thing. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. And Jesus says, 
with compassion, with a heart for each of our broken, messed up selves, I am willing, through me, be healed through the blood that I left on the cross for you, be healed. And so as we take the bread, may we be reminded of a Savior who was willing to step into the pain, to step into the gap for us, and to take the punishment, and to show us with compassion how much we are loved. Let's pray. Lord, we are at a place where we couldn't even imagine how much pain your son suffered on our behalf. It's beyond our understanding. It's beyond our comprehension. And most of us um, haven't had an opportunity to experience such great pain, even, even a percentage of that. And here you did it willingly for us. We, quite honestly, we weren't worthy. We didn't care. We turned our back. Today we come... And we are doing this in remembrance of you, that we remember what you did to save us. Father, we are grateful for your son, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. gives you life is the one who's also willing to die for you. And he did that. And it gives you not only life here and today, but life eternal. There is no greater gift. There is no greater love. It's already happened and it's already been done for you. And so today as we take of the cup, may we be reminded of that blood, the blood that was spilled, that paid your paid your debt, paid my debt paid our debt. Not just partially, not just paying down a little bit, not just lowering your interest rate, but paid in full. And it is because of the greatest love of all. Let's pray. Jesus, you are beyond us. You are God. And you stepped out of heaven and onto a cross so that we could be with you for all eternity. So many days go by that we don't pay attention or think about that or remind ourselves of it. May we do a better job of living a life that points to our appreciation, to our love for you, for what you have already done for us. And as we take of the cup this morning, may we be reminded of the fact that you did something that we could never do for ourselves. We didn't deserve it. And yet, you did it anyway because you want us around. You want the best for us in all that we do. Thank you for loving us that way. Thank you for loving us to death. In Jesus' name we pray.
to sign over your house. You don't have to give up your car. God wants your heart. He sent his son to die for you, that you would see the heart that he has for you. And so today as we come and we worship and we think about the fact that here the God of the universe was willing to make such a sacrifice for, sacrifice for us that all he asks is that we would love him. He's asking for us to love him like someone who has just saved our lives. Right? And you know, we really don't have anything else to give. And when we do, when we surrender that, and give the life that was bought at a price back to the Lord. He blesses it in ways we could never hope for or imagine. If you are at a place today where you are still thinking, yeah, I'm not so sure that's for me. I get it. I was there. I understand. But when we think about who God is and what he has already done, we should be having a worship set every day. Can you imagine what it would be like if you were caught in a situation where it was life or death and the president stepped up and took a bullet for you and how much you would be lifting up his name, whoever that president happened to be. And somebody has already done that. It's already happened. Your life has already been saved. The question is, are you willing to receive it? And so today... As I am doing every Sunday from here on, I want to be here up front at the end of our service. If you need prayer for relational things, for spiritual things, for financial things, if you just feel the need to get closer to God, come on down and let's pray. If you feel like you want to make that commitment and say, yes, I'm in. This God who was willing to do this for me, I want to be a part of his family. We can talk about that and pray about that too. Because, because he loves you. It's that simple. But it happens to be the biggest love you could ever imagine. Beyond everything and anything, you are that loved. And so today as you go out, May the Holy Spirit fill you and move every footstep, every take, help you take every breath, and may everything you do and everything you step into be filled with the light of God through you. And may your presence in other people's lives change hearts and lives too. Let that love grow through you guys. Let that love flow through you. I love you. God loves you. I'm going to tell you, you are dismissed. Have an amazing rest of your Sunday. Have a fantastic week. Keep praying and watch what God does.